is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Science Max! Today, we're looking at polymers. Polymers, polymers, polymers. Word has lost all meaning. Plastics, latex, rubber, and our favorite polymer, slime. Oh, yeah. All on this episode of Science Max, experiments at large. Hello, oh, greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and I think I might have overdone it with the science. I mean, what's a better use of science than creating a whole bunch of slime? Well, I did, and you know what? It's really cool. <laughs> slime. I love slime. It always makes me feel like a mad scientist, but I need a good mad scientist laugh. <laughs> Yeah, it needs work. Anyway, today we're talking about polymers. Polymers like slime. But you see, polymers aren't really a substance. They're more how something is constructed. And there's all kinds of different polymers. There's slime, obviously, and rubber polymers, like, well, like rubber. And there's also hard polymers, like plastic. Now, polymers are all kind of constructed the same way, like this. This is a chain. Yeah, so imagine this is a chain of molecules and all the molecules are the same and they just repeat in a long line. Now, when you get a polymer like slime, all the chains are not connected or very loosely connected, which means that they can flow over each other like a slime or sort of like a liquid and they behave like that. So that is slime. But when you get to a rubber polymer, you start to get little bonds in between the chains of polymers that work like this. You see, they still move around a little bit, but they can, they can spread apart and they become flexible and bouncy. Yeah, I know, a chain, a chain doesn't really bounce, but rubber polymers do. Huh? Now, when it gets to a solid polymer like plastic, there's a lot more links and it's all kind of interconnected and it doesn't move at all. It doesn't move, okay, again, harder to tell with a chain, but plastic is very hard and rigid. So let's dive into the world of polymers and make some slime. <laughs> yeah, too mad, not enough scientist. I'll keep working on it. Anyway, to make slime, take your white glue and pour in uh, an amount. It really kind of depends on how much slime you want to make. Now, you want to add about twice as much water as that. Uh, yeah, somewhere around there, great. Now we want to put in just a little bit of soap. Mm -hmm, maybe there, that's good. And you want to put in your food coloring. I like green. Green seems like the right slime color to me. It's the right appropriate mad scientist kind of slime. And then you want to start mixing that up till you get the right kind of consistency. That means make sure the glue and the water are equally mixed up. Good. And now we're ready to make it an actual slime by bonding the polymers together by adding liquid starch. Mm -hmm. Very good. And you want to mix it up. When you add the liquid starch, it starts to bond the chains of molecules together, changing it from a liquid to a slime. It's coming along. And there you go. Slime. Now, if you want clear slime and not opaque slime, you want to use clear glue and not white glue. But that's basically the recipe. So there you go. Slime. <laughs> Too super villain? Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, we go. All right. Now all you need is an expert to help me max it out. Of course, my interface is hand gesture based, so I don't know if the slime. Oh, hey, there we go. Great. So, you get it. Uh huh. Uh, oh, of course. Sarah from Mad Science. Mad Science, they really know their slime. This is great. Okay, I got it. Close, close, close. Close. Hey, there we go. All right. Ugh. I'm not sure if bringing it through the portal is such a good idea, but at least I'll have it on the other side. Ugh. I have a pot. Why do I have a pot? I didn't have a pot when I went through the portal. Is someone somewhere missing a pot, or did it just create this pot out of nothing? Huh. Oh. Hey, hey, Sarah. Hey, hi. How are you doing? Good. 
right, Sarah from Mad Size, you're gonna help me make some slime. Yes, I actually brought some. Oh, this isn't this isn't slime. This is a pot lid. Hey. Oh. oh. Well, uh, at least we have a set. Doesn't answer any questions though. And I guess we're gonna have to make some more slime. Definitely. What kind of slime do you want to make? Uh, what do you mean, what kind? Is there more than one kind? Oh yeah, there are tons of different kinds of slime with lots of different ingredients and recipes. Oh, I only know the one. Can you show me all the others? Of course, let's go make some right now. Okay, great. <laughs> Come on down to Sal's Science Shop and see me, Sal, while you shop for science. This week only, Sal's one of a kind, once a year polymer sale. 50 to 75 percent off anything made of polymers. Rubber? That's a polymer. Polystyrene. When you're eating your next meal, I recommend some polypropylene. Low density polyethylene. High density polyethylene. You want some polytetrafluoroethylene? We got it. We've even got polychlorotrifluoroethylene. Do they even know how good a deal this is? Cause you're not gonna find, you're not gonna find that kind of deal just like every day. But hold the phone. Polymers aren't just plastics. Rayon, nylon, Teflon, you name the lawn, we got it on. Sale. What, what do, do we, we want? want? Polymers. When, when do we, we want, want them? them? Anytime during normal business hours. Wool, silk, even cotton. Polymers, polymers, polymers. Polymers, polymers, polymers. Word has lost all meaning. Glue, paint, umbrella fabric, oh yeah. Carpet, you bet that's on sale. Roberta, I'm running out of sale signs. Buy it and I'll put it in a plastic bag, also made of polymers. Seriously, Roberta, we can't have a sale on everything. Oh, hey, hey, even you, even me, the proteins in our bodies, even our DNA, all polymers. So come on down to Sal's Science Shop and get a great deal on your polymers for a limited time. I mean, it'd have to be a limited time, right, Roberta? Because, I mean, I can't discount everything in the store to 75% off. How am I going to make any money? I mean, are we still rolling? One hundred different kinds of slime. Yes, it's gonna be so much fun, but we're not gonna make a hundred today. Yeah, I know. We're just gonna do our top favorites. Yeah, it's gonna be super great. All right, what are we starting with? So our first slime we're starting with today is some really cool molding slime. Now this slime, actually, if you leave it out overnight, it'll harden, and you can make an imprint of whatever you like. So here we made an imprint of our little uh, tool there. So we're gonna look at a little bit more liquidy slime, starting with this one over here, which I believe you already know about. This is cornstarch mud. Exactly. You hold this. Sounds good. I'm gonna good. hold this and we're gonna try pouring it. Ooh, oh, Whoa. so. See, it's like, it's like a liquid. Let me do it fast, it's like a solid. All right. What's over here, we have some pretty awesome mix of slime. So right over here, we have some crunchy slime. Slime. Crunchy slime? Exactly. Why is it crunchy? Now it's crunchy. We've actually added a few bead crunchies. This is a really cool, awesome slime. Here, you can take half. And you can feel the beads as you get stretch it out. It's so cool. This is what uh, this Exactly. I'll just do that. All right, so what's next? So next we have some really cool glow in the dark slime. Glow in the dark slime? Yeah, it's so awesome. Ooh, look at how much it glows. That glows a lot. That's super glowy slime. So to do the different kinds of slime, we need the polymer. Yes. And then the thing that sticks the polymers together. Exactly. So the glue is the polymer. Glue is the polymer. And the starch is the thing that bonds it. Yes. Uh-huh. Very cool. And then you put the thing in that makes it the, the kind of slime. Yes, right before you add the bonding component, because if we keep uh, adding stuff after it's already made, it unfortunately won't be able to take it. So we add our powder before we add our starch in this situation. Uh, should we go <laughs> on to the next thing? Yeah, let's move on to the More slime. slime. Plastic is great and plastic is everywhere. But the problem with plastic is it isn't very biodegradable. It, it doesn't break down in the environment. <laughs> I'm still on hold. Oh well. There you go. Back for another couple years, I guess. But here's a way that you can make bioplastic. It's fully biodegradable because it's made of natural materials. The recipe is easy. Two parts cornstarch, three parts water. A few drops of cooking oil and some food coloring to make it whatever color you want. Purple, science purple. Mix it up and it turns into a paste. Now what you'll need are two things. One, an adult and two, a microwave. 
Put it in for 30 seconds. Clock wipe. There we go. Then take it out and mix it some more until it cools down. Then you can pull it out and use your hands to sculpt it into a shape or take the shape of something else. Once you put it all the way around, you can turn it into a little flower pot. Once you've sculpted it, you need to wait for it to dry, which will take about a day. Clock wipe. After waiting a day... Uh, uh, huh? Uh, what? It's been a day? Oh. You have something made out of bioplastic. Like this little flower pot you can use to grow a small plant. And then when it grows big enough, you can take this biodegradable flower pot and plant it right outside in the dirt, and this pot will biodegrade and turn back into dirt. Pretty cool, right? Well, let's max it out. Biodegradable Frisbee! Check it out! It's a Frisbee, but it's biodegradable. So you throw it around in the park, but if you lose it, it turns back into dirt. <laughs> What, not enough? Okay, clock wipe! Biodegradable lawn chair! Use it for one season and then return it to the earth afterwards. I think this is one of my best science max. I... Okay, bioplastic lawn chair not as strong as regular lawn chair. We've learned that lesson now, so that's, that's good to know. I mean, I mean, how would I have known if I hadn't tried it? Sarah and I are looking at different recipes for slime. All right, what do we got here? So over here we have some amazing foamy slime which has so, so many ingredients in it. Here, watch what happens when we start pulling it out. Ooh, wow. So it's like... Super stretchy Whoa. and super fluffy. Here, that's great. Okay, now we gotta, you gotta hold yours. You gotta hold this in. Okay, you take, and then take some more. And then we take that. And then, yeah. <laughs> It gets thinner and thinner and it becomes more and more lines of foamy slime. Yeah. And the last kind of slime we made today is some classic flubber slime. Ooh. It's so much fun. Now, why do you think it's called is it flubber slime? Because it's, is it really a slime? It is a slime, yeah. It's super fun and it's oh. super stretchy. Oh, okay, I get it. Look, look at that, and it's sort of like, like a little bit like gelatin. It is almost like gelatin. Here, you can have some. There you go, whoa. Oh, ha, ha. Whoa. All right, so Sarah, now what we need to decide mm -hmm. is how we're gonna max it out. Right. Like, should we just get a lot of slime? That sounds like a really good idea, but we are gonna need something to put it in because we can't just have slime all over the floor. Okay, you're right. So we'll get we'll get some sort of container thing. Yeah. And we'll see how much slime we can make, and then we'll just play with it and see what happens. Sounds good. And yeah, we will experiment because it's science. Yeah. Okay, hi. High five. Careful high five so we don't splatter. Okay, good. Okay, let's go. This is it. This is a rubber glove. Well, actually, it's a latex glove. What's the difference? I will get to that in a second. But I'm sure you can agree, it's super stretchy. How stretchy? Let's fill a rubber glove with water and see how big it gets. <laughs> so. Difference between latex and rubber. Well, it all comes from a rubber tree. Well, actually, it's a fake tree. It's just to show you how it works. The sap of the rubber tree is collected just like this. There's a spigot, and then the sap goes out, and it's collected. It's the same way that the sap for our maple syrup is collected. And this, this is natural latex. If it's dried out, it becomes natural rubber. Latex generally means the liquid form, and rubber means the solid form. But wait, then why is this a latex glove? <laughs> the glove is not liquid. What's the deal? Well, generally, latex means water-based or liquid, like latex paint. But it could also mean synthetic latex. That's latex that's man-made and doesn't come from a rubber tree. So, we call rubber gloves rubber gloves because they used to come from rubber trees, but now they're usually made out of man-made latex. But either way, they're super stretchy. I wonder how big this is gonna get. <laughs> Science! Sarah and I are maxing out polymer slime. How? Maxed out tub of slime! Whoa! 
Okay, so how do you feel? Is it, uh, are we mixed up enough? First, we mix up a bunch of slime in a garbage bin. So with the polymer chemistry, the polymer is generally a liquid, right? Yep. And the bonding agent makes it stick together. So the more we use, the more of a solid we get. Exactly, so yeah. So we want to split it and make it sort of halfway between a liquid and a solid, and I think we're exactly at the right stage. It looks perfect. Oh, yeah. OK, so let's dump this garbage can in. All right. All right. Then we dump it in. <laughs> oh, God. Whoa. It turns out we needed more slime. Um. I don't think that's gonna be enough. I think we may need some more slime. Yeah, how much more do you think we need? So, we added 11 more. Ah, delicious. Oh, yeah. Then we experimented. Oh, oh, yeah. We have a giant, giant tub of slime. <laughs> because the slime is stretchy, it created amazing bubbles. So do you think I could blow a bubble with the slime? Well, do maybe I, not you, but definitely the air compressor. This? No, either, uh, no, I'd have to just put it on my face. I think yeah. I've already got it on my face. Then there was only one thing left to do. We get in this line. Can we do that? We can totally do that. This is science math. That's so exciting. Going <laughs> swimming in slime. Yes. Who's going first? You are. I am, obviously. All right. is everywhere, but what can we do with it aside from recycle it? Well, we can reuse it to make cool plastic charms. But you're gonna need the right kind of plastic, and you need polystyrene. Just look for the little number six inside the recycle symbol. Cut out some plastic and decorate it however you want. There we go. Haha, <laughs> check it out. The Science Max logo. Also, I've made a couple other things. I've got a chemical symbol, an atom, and this is me in some slime. Then get an adult to help you put it in the oven or toaster oven at 350 degrees. It only takes a few seconds for the plastic to shrink to one third its size. The reason why this happens is when plastic is manufactured, it's heated and stretched out and then cooled, and it sort of freezes in that stretched out shape. And when you reheat it, it shrinks back down to the unstretched shape. Get your adult to take it out and wait for it to cool, and you'll have yourself some small plastic designs you can use for keychains, bracelets, name tags, bookmarks, whatever you want, all using the power of polymers. Awesome, I'm gonna make all of those. What was that again? Keychain, ornament, magnet. Um... Magnetic putty in 60 seconds. This is magnetic putty. Thank you. This is magnetic putty. Ten take. This is magnetic putty. 26. This is magnetic putty. 2,635. This is, yes, yeah, this is magnetic putty. I can't count this high. This is magnetic putty. <laughs> magnetic. Oh. oh, it's not a magnet. It's attracted to magnets. Oh, that makes more sense. This is magnetic putty, and this is a magnet. The putty is made of polymers, which means it can flow over itself. It also has lots of iron filings in it, which is why it's attracted to magnets. This is what happens over several minutes. And there you go, magnetic putty. Okay, so where were we? Oh yeah. Three, two, one, yeah! And remember, don't try this at home. Ah! and I enjoyed our maxed out tub of slime. So let's recap. Slime is made of polymers. Polymers come in a lot of different forms. It's all about long chains of molecules. And none are more fun to swim in than slime.
You have slime hair? Ooh, yeah, definitely. Slime hair! Oh, slime hair! <laughs> well, there you go. Science Max experiments at large. Polymers! Slime! Yeah! High fives. Yeah! Slimey high five. Yeah! Do it! Yeah! Did you see it? Is that still close? Am I too close to the camera? Biodegradable Frisbee! Do I, am I looking at this camera? Or is it this one? Is it this one? First, you need that bowl I told James to go and wash. Forgot to ask him back for that. But hold the phone. Nylons, nylons. That's latex that is, man, uh, uh, science. Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. This episode of Science Max is all about storing energy and releasing it. Yeah, let's try it out for real. Storing it in a giant spool racer, plus a domino chain reaction, mouse trap chain reaction, popsicle stick chain reaction, and more. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. <laughs> okay, three, two, one, go. Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. Wow, I really need some more energy. Fortunately, I have some saved up. Ah, that's better. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Storing energy like that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but you can store energy, and that's what this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large is all about. In fact, I'm gonna store some energy in this container simply by putting it up here on the top shelf. More on that later. But right now, let's look at another way that you can store energy and release it in a really fun way. We're gonna make a spool racer, and it's pretty simple. Here's all you need. You need some science ribbon. Now, if you don't have science ribbon, you can use regular ribbon, but the ribbon really isn't important. It's the spool that's important. You'll also need a washer, elastics, pencil or pencil crayon, popsicle or craft stick, and science tape. Science tape is the same as invisible tape, except I use this one only for science. Here's how you build it. Break the popsicle stick so it's smaller than the diameter of the spool. Then put the elastics on top of the pencil and pull them tight, thread the popsicle stick through, and feed it all through the hole of the spool. Grab the elastics on the other side and pull out the pencil and everything will be threaded perfectly. Then stick on the washer and thread the pencil through. Finally, tape the popsicle stick down so it doesn't move. And if any of these steps are a little too fast, don't worry. All of the instructions are up on the website. That was cool. I, uh, I, can't, I can't make it go away. I can only make it come up. So there you go, a spool racer. And here's how it works. You spin the pencil around, and that twists the elastic. Now that elastic is going to want to unwind, right? So just keep spinning that pencil around until it's good and tight. And then when you put it on the ground, the pencil's gonna wanna unwind, but it can't because the table's in the way now, which means that the energy is gonna transfer to the spool, which is gonna turn, whoa, and it's gonna drive away. Yeah, let's try it out for real. So why does this work? It works because the elastic is coiled, right? Yes, and because I'm putting in the energy to twist it. You see, I'm putting in effort to spin this pencil crayon around, and then when I've finished, all of my effort has been stored in the elastic. When I let it go, my energy transfers into movement. So that's, uh-oh. That's what we're gonna do today, Science Maximites. We're gonna max out the spool racer. I think Anthony would really know how to help me with this. So, I'm off to the Ontario Science Center. Come on. What happened? Phil! What happened? 
happened? Are you okay? Anthony. Yeah, hi. Oh, were you, in the, were you in the middle of something? I don't worry about it, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. You know what, I was wondering if I could get your, your help with something. Sure, yeah. Yeah, one word, spool racer. Actually, actually, that's two words. Spool, yeah. spool yeah. racer. That's yeah. Awesome. You want to help me max out a giant spool racer? Uh, yeah. Awesome. Let's go back to Science Matt headquarters. Okay, Anthony. Today, I want to max out the spool racer. Awesome. Right. So you twist up the elastic, and it goes from potential energy all stored to kinetic. Kinetic energy. Whoa. There we go. That's awesome. So. Okay. Not too hard to design. Should be fairly easy to yeah, max. Yeah. Really out. simple. Couple of parts here. We just got elastic band inside. Yep. And then this big long pencil to store the energy and then release it. And the most important part. Ah. Is spool. Is the spool. Exactly. And exactly. I know where we should start. Where's that? Right here. This is an industrial uh -huh. cable spool. So the big, thick electrical cables, they come wound on this thing. Yeah, OK. So that figure. we Whoa. start with this. Got right? it. And the good news is that it's got a hole already. And check it out. It rolls. It rolls really well, right? Uh-huh. OK, cool. Uh -huh. OK, OK. So. Uh, bungee cord? Yep. And long pole or something? Yeah. And uh, we're ready to go. I guess let's get some parts. Okay. Okay. Oh, hey, how you doing? Y you want to buy something? I got a lot of stuff here. And I got a special today only. Potential energy, huh? I will throw in some potential energy with any order. You see this stuff on the shelves here? The stuff on the higher shelves has more potential energy than the stuff on the lower shelves. Don't believe me? Here, hold on, hold on. Look at this state-of-the-art traffic controller. Right now, it's sitting up here on this high shelf. Now, if it were to fall, it would be going fast, which means it would have a lot of kinetic energy. <laughs> you see, when it fell down, <laughs> It had enough kinetic energy to completely break itself apart. Um, yeah. Well, that's the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy. Look at this bagel, just sitting here, not moving, minding its own business on top of this ramp. It's all potential energy and no kinetic energy. And when it gets to the floor, it's all kinetic energy and no potential energy. <laughs> and now it has neither because it's on the floor and it's not moving. <laughs> Five second rule. And now you know your energy. So what do you say? You want this thing? Uh, tell you what, I'll, I'll give you a discount because, because you know it's it's gently used. Hey, I'll even throw in this bagel, huh? Also gently used. Anthony and I are maxing out the spool racer. We start with a long coil of bungee cord, which is kind of like a giant elastic, and feed it through the spool. Then we put on a big piece of plastic to act as our washer and use a long pole as the pencil. We flip the spool on its side to wind it up. Then we flip it back and it's ready to go. All right, so we have it all wound up and we're ready to try it again, but with one change. Uh, Phil. Yeah. What's with the trike? I ride the trike. It's like I always say, what's the point of building something big if I can't ride it? There's no way you're going to fit on this thing. No, no, I don't, I don't put my feet on the pedals. I put my feet here on the back, right? And OK, then, yeah, and I get then, it, I get it. You got it? Uh, hold, hold on, I got to do my helmet up. Safety first. You ready? I'm on it. OK, three. Two, one, go. Oh, it's working. It's working. <laughs> Amazing. All the stored energy in the bungee cord is being released, and the spool starts to turn. There's even enough energy that I can get pulled along behind it. It's not going that fast, no, though. And it's... it's pretty good, though. It still pulls me. Right? Yeah, pretty good. So spool racer actually able to get pulled by it. Yeah. You know what? I think we can go even bigger. Bigger? Yes. Well, what did you have in mind? I'm glad you asked. Uh, oh, oh, yeah! What, you, what is this? What this you... is an industrial cable spool, and this is the biggest size that they make. 
<laughs> and I thought we would do the same thing with this. What do you think? I think this could generate a huge amount of energy. Okay, so all we gotta do is just build it just like we built that other one. Just bigger. Except way bigger. Let's do it. <laughs> when you set a domino on its end, you're giving it potential energy because it can fall. Ooh, and when you put two dominoes together, you can start a chain reaction, because that one will fall into that one. Ah, but it's a lot more fun with more dominoes. Setting up a run of dominoes is a lot of fun, but it takes a flat surface and a steady hand. And if you want to do it yourself, add gaps, so if one part falls, it doesn't take out the whole run. Last one. There, I had some dominoes left, but I did it. I made the Science Max logo. See, Science right? Max. Sort of. Let's see how it works. Ready? Yeah! <laughs> now it's time to max it out. Giant maxed out dominoes! Even though these dominoes are giant, they're still gonna work the same. They're standing up on their ends, which means they've got some potential energy. And when I give this one a push, that potential is gonna turn into kinetic energy and it's gonna knock the next one and the next one and the next one. I, I hope, we, I don't know what's gonna happen, but let's find out, you ready? Okay, three, two, one. The problem is, when you use dominoes this big, setting them up again is a real chore. <sighs> this is a mouse trap. But don't worry, no mice are gonna be harmed in the making of this episode. Mouse traps are a great example of stored energy. You see, in order to set a mouse trap, you have to push this bar back. And it's hard to do because the spring holds it. And then you set the mouse trap by putting this little lever underneath this very sensitive trigger. And once you have it set, all that energy is stored as potential energy, but it'll go off with just the slightest touch, releasing the energy. So what if I had a number of mouse traps and they're all set and all of that potential energy is stored up and I dropped a number of ping pong balls on them? Well, then I could set off a chain reaction where one mouse trap flies and hits another mouse trap that hits a ping pong ball and then they all go. Now this is something you can try at home, but do not set the mouse traps yourself. It can really hurt if it snaps on your fingers, so you should probably ask an adult to help you, and then you can see how brave the adults in your house are. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Mouse trap, chain reaction! <laughs> and last one, there we go. And now, let's max this out. Let's do it with 90 mouse traps. And this is a crate of ping pong balls. So, Let's see what happens when we put them together. Maxed out ping pong ball mouse trap chain reaction. <sighs> awesome. Ready? I'm on it. Anthony and I have built a large okay, spool three. racer. Oh, it's working. It's working. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked so well, the only option was to go bigger. What is this? this is an industrial cable spool, and this is the biggest size that they make. I think this could generate a huge amount of energy. Huge... Building our giant spool racer is the same process as the other builds. So the steps are exactly the same, but on a larger scale. And this time, we're gonna use, obviously, the large spool, and we're gonna use this two by four as our pencil windy thing. Coil some bungee cord, feed it through. Ready? Yep. Okay, here it comes. 
Ah, there we go. Got it? Haha, <laughs> yeah. Add a washer and a long 2x4 to act as our pencil. And now we stick the giant 2x4 inside the coil. Just about. Yeah, we got it. There okay, we cool. go. And we're ready to try it out. So it looks like we're ready to go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, do you want to do it in here or you want to do it outside? Oh, definitely outside. Okay, let's go. Yeah, okay, cool. Yep. Oh, it's heavy. Right. Batteries are great at storing energy. They store electricity. Batteries. But if you're like me and you have a whole bunch of batteries and you don't remember which are the good ones and which are the dead ones, there's a trick that you can use to find out. Get a frying pan or a brick or a concrete floor or something else that's very, very hard and an adult's permission. Here's the secret. Dead batteries will bounce and batteries that still have some life in them won't. Watch. Good battery. Dead battery. Now, it's a little hard to see, but listen. One hit. Two hits. Here's what's going on. See, batteries store electricity in the form of a gel, sort of like modeling clay. This is modeling clay, fresh from the fields, where the pit, the pits, the mine, wherever modeling clay comes from. And this is modeling clay I've left out for about five days, so it's all dried up and hard. Now, when modeling clay is new, it's all wet and soft. And when you drop it, it doesn't bounce very well. I've left this piece of modeling clay out to dry for about five days. Now it's all dried up and old and it bounces. New, old. So, same thing with the battery. Good batteries won't bounce, and bad batteries will. Science. Here's a fun chain reaction you can do with popsicle sticks, or craft sticks, because these ones are a little bit wider than popsicle sticks. It is because these kind of sticks are slightly bendy, and when you bend them and put them together in a pattern in a certain way, you can keep them under tension, and then they want to snap back, and then they'll fly. So here's how you make the pattern. Ready? You take a popsicle stick or a craft stick, and you put it down on the table. I know, OK, it's a slow start. And we take another one and put it across. Now comes the secret. The secret is over and then under. You want to put it over one and then under another, like that. And then this one over, under. Put it over the one that looks like it's the top stick and under the stick that looks like it's the bottom stick. And then it starts to hold tension. It starts to hold the potential energy. Continue this pattern. Each stick goes over and under the two sticks at the end. Now here's the trick. Soon as this one lets go, then that one will let go, then that one, then that one, then that one, and that's how you get the chain reaction. They all start flying up. So you have to build it with never letting go of that last stick. You've got to always remember to keep a hand on it, or else you'll have to start again. So, OK, so you ready? You want to see me let it go? Here we go. I know, that isn't so great, because it's better if it's a longer chain. So fortunately, I have a longer chain. I've got a binder clip on this end, keeping the craft sticks together. Ready? Three. Two, one. Wow! Release of kinetic energy from the potential energy of winding all the craft sticks together. Fun, and you can totally do it at home. Now, let's max it out. Behold, almost 800 craft sticks in a long, nicely designed triangle. Ready? Two. One. Yeah! Craft stick chain reaction. I'm going to go get something to clean this all up with. All right. So Anthony and I have built a giant spool racer and have taken it outside to try it out. In order to wind it up, we flipped over the last version on its side. But this spool weighs 200 kilograms. Easy to roll, almost impossible to flip over. 
Come on, get it. I don't think it's gonna work. It's too heavy to move. Yeah. We should have thought of that before. Well, I'm sure we'll think of something. Uh... So Anthony and I thought about it. <laughs> and thought about it. <sighs> and thought about it. I got it! What? No. No. But you... And the answer finally dawned. What if we roll it this way? Because then that would wind it up, right? That's brilliant! By rolling it backwards, we wind up the bungee cord in one direction, which will make it want to unwind in the other direction. Anthony and I roll it across the parking lot to get it wound up tight. I don't think I'm gonna hold it anymore. <sighs> okay. Okay. Let go. Uh, okay, okay, it's wedged. It worked. Uh, all right, one more thing. We're gonna hook the trike up to this one as well. Okay. Okay. So right now, it's all wound up, and when it gets moving, the potential energy in the coil will turn into kinetic. Exactly. Kinetic energy. Now, just in case you're tempted to try this at home, I need to tell you, do not try this at home. We're trained professionals, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Well, as much as anybody can be trained for this, because no one uh. really <laughs> does this. Are you ready? Ready. OK, here we go. <sighs> oh. <laughs> it's working! It's working! Yeah! <laughs> sure enough, all the potential energy we stored in the bungee cords starts to unwind, which rolls the spool and pulls me along behind it. What's more, that big heavy spool has a lot of momentum. Yeah! So when it gets going fast, it just wants to keep moving. It wasn't long before I had to jump off. Uh oh! oh. Of kinetic energy. That was a ton of kinetic energy. There you go. Science Max, experiments at large. Massive spool racer. Your turn next? Yeah. OK. So that's what we're going to do today, Science Maximites. Whoa. <laughs> we are going to learn how to juggle. I can't hear you. I've got dominoes in my ears. And you put it in, and whoa. And now it's all broken. Well, here's a trick to let that, that here's the trick. It's me disappearing. <laughs> you see? When it would, when it would. <laughs> Looper reel? Looper reel. Okay, okay. hi. Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Science Max! Newton's third law is the science behind balloon-powered rocket cars. It's also the science behind a maxed-out rocket car that I can ride. Plus, bowling balls and an interrupting sign. Today on Science Max, experiments at large. Greetings, Science Maximites. I am Phil McCordick, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be experimenting with the balloon-powered car. Here's how it works. Woohoo! It all has to do with Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, we don't, we don't have to do this now. We can, this is all for later. We can build the cars first and then we can, uh, let's go over here. So how do you build a balloon powered car? Well, I suggest you be science maximites because there's any number of ways you can build a balloon powered car. You do not have to follow my design. You should come up with one of your own. It may even be better than the one I built, but I will give you some tips though that make it a lot easier. First of all, you need something to stick your balloon on that has an opening on it. I used a turkey baster for this car. I just pop the top off, 
and remember to tell an adult that you're using the turkey baster. And then you stick the balloon on there and it allows you to attach something to the car and it also makes it easier to blow up the balloon. <laughs> you can use any number of things, even just uh, any kind of tube that you find lying around. It helps you attach the balloon to the car and it helps you blow up the balloon way easier. The other thing you should think about when you make your balloon powered car is how you're going to make the wheels roll. Once you've decided on the base of the car, you could use anything, even just a piece of cardboard like this. You can do your wheels in two ways. The first way is to attach the wheels to the axle. This is how I made the axle of this car. I used a shish kebab skewer and I stuck it inside a straw, just like that. And then I attached the lids to the shish kebab skewer. So the lids and the shish kebab skewer are attached and they rotate in the straw. That's one way to make the wheels turn. The other way is to tape down the axle or whatever you're going to use uh, and have the wheels spin around on the axle. Two great ways to make your wheels turn and it really kind of depends on the wheels you're using. You can make your own design and keep refining it and making it better and faster or do what I like to do and make a whole bunch of different cars. So we've got this one. Uh, this one I made out of paper plates and this is a snorkel. Awesome. This one is the rock car because there's a rock on it. I've got uh, the dragster model. It's a long broom handle, and it might not work that well, but who, who knows? And this is my favorite design. It's made out of waffles and an ice cube tray. This is why I make a whole bunch of different cars, because I can race them. Sunday, 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 at the Science Maxidrome. It's the balloon powered car winner take all drag race of awesome. First up, the Eliminator. Better late than never, it's the Procrastinator! <laughs> Crushing the competition, it's the Terminator! When you build your balloon-powered cars, you can figure out what worked or uh, what didn't work and try modifying your designs to make them work even better. That is science. And now we're gonna max it out because this is Science Max Experiments at Large. So we're gonna take that small balloon-powered car that we just built and we're gonna make it much, much bigger. I'm gonna go to the Center for Skills Development and Training and we're gonna use the science behind the small balloon-powered car and we're gonna make it big. That science is Newton's third law. But there's Newton's plenty of third law. No, there's, for every action, there's, there's there plenty of time for this later. We're not doing action. we're not doing this bit now. We're doing that bit in a minute. So we can wait, wait, no, I, I said we're doing it later. We're doing it later. <sighs> oh. uh, hi, Sarah. Hi, Phil. This is Sarah, and she's got a master's degree in physics from McMaster University. That's right. And we're going to be talking about Newton's third law. Ooh, look out, look out, duck. Uh, sorry, sorry. There was a sign that kept coming in. Um, never mind. Newton's third law. Well, what is that? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right. So how does that work with our balloon car? Ah, cool. OK, so if you blow up the balloon, What's going to happen when you release it is the air is going to push out with a certain force, which in turn is going to cause the cart to move forward with the exact same force. Yeah, works great. So how come it doesn't work with my rock cart? Ah, wow. Well, actually, it did work. So the balloon still pushes with the exact same force, which causes the cart to have the exact same force push forward, but your 
rock is really heavy, so you probably didn't see it move. Oh, so a lighter cart works better with the same amount of force. That's it. Well, there you go. Newton's third law. What? Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. I'm really starting to dislike that sign. Phil, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Our small balloon-powered car works because of Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The air pushing out the balloon this way pushes the car with the same amount of force this way. So, in order to max it out, the plan is just to get a bigger wheeled cart and a much bigger balloon. So, everything should work out the same. Okay, so, sir, oh, I thought what we would do is I would, in order to max out the balloon-powered car, what we need is a cart to start with, and then I ride it. And we have a giant balloon, and then I go. Do you have a giant balloon? Ha, 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 Giant balloon! So, step one, uh, Sarah blows up the balloon. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Use this air compressor, it'll probably be a lot faster. Sarah and I get to work blowing up the balloon, and it takes a long time. A uh, very long time. Okay, human-sized balloon-powered car test. Take one. All right, Sarah. You got it? Yeah. Okay, let it go. Okay, go, go. Let it go. <laughs> I and did. You did let it go. I just let go. Nothing is happening. It's not coming out fast enough, and you're a bit too massive. I don't think it's going to work like this. Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, balloon powered car test two. No fill. I'll just take it. And... Ah! What happened? Uh, I don't think it worked. The balloon popped. Phil, are you okay? This is why you wear protective eyewear. Uh, yeah. So, that didn't work. No. No. Should we get another balloon? Uh, I think uh, we need something else. Okay, well, the air coming out of the balloon just what, didn't have enough force, so. We need the air to come out with more force. Yeah, do we get, what, a bigger a bigger balloon? I don't think that's gonna work. I don't think it's that. I think we need something with compressed air. Oh, like a scuba tank or a... Fire extinguisher, something like that. Yeah, that, that's what we need. Okay, sure. Well, we can, all right, so I don't know if that's safe to do that, so we'd have to build a, like a cage or yeah, something. Yeah, I don't know if it's gonna work on this. All right, well, back back to the drawing board. So okay. what we should do is we should get a... We need a, to find these tanks. You get the tanks and then we make a, like a frame out of aluminum or something. Okay, that could work. Yeah, That's they can hold idea. the tanks so yeah. they're safe. And then what we should do is... Who was Isaac Newton? He was a mathematician and probably number one on the list of top scientists of all time. Albert Einstein said, Isaac Newton was the smartest person that ever lived. You've got to be special if Einstein is calling you smart. Newton's three laws of motion was a huge idea, but did you know Newton also came up with the idea of gravity? The famous story is that in 1666, Isaac Newton was sitting under an apple tree when he watched an apple fall and wondered why. Hey everyone, I just invented gravity, which was a big relief because up until then, everyone was just floating around. Okay, so it didn't happen like that. He didn't invent gravity. He gave a name to this invisible force and then described how it works. Not only did it make things fall down, but it was the same force that kept the moon circling the Earth and the Earth circling the sun. And he invented a new kind of math to explain how. We now call it calculus. See, I told you he was smart. He's very smart. This is hydrophobic coating. Hydrophobic literally means afraid of water, but it's not actually afraid of water. The chemistry of a hydrophobic coating prevents water molecules from penetrating anything you spray it on. You can get this stuff at the hardware store, and if you want, be science maximites and get an adult and think of the coolest thing you could spray with hydrophobic coating. I like to use things that do not go well when you put them in water, like uh, tissue. Yeah, doesn't look great when it gets wet. Here's a tissue coated in hydrophobic coating. Huh? Weird. Or it works the same with a paper towel. Paper towel in water, paper towel covered in hydrophobic coating. 
stays dry. Or how about a dinner roll? Dinner rolls really don't like water. See, gross. But a dinner roll coated in hydrophobic coating? Weird, just don't eat it. Now it's time to max it out. I have coated half of my lab coat in hydrophobic coating and the other half I have not. Hydrophobic coating, regular lab coat. Half of me is wet and half of me is dry. What's more, half of my outfit ended up being wet and half dry because the lab coat was protecting my outfit from getting wet. Now it's time to max it out even more. We have coated my entire outfit in hydrophobic spray. My shirt, my pants, and my lab coat. The pants have been taped to rubber boots, so no water's getting in there. And my shirt has been taped to my pants, so no water's getting in there. So here's the question. Can I get into the pool and out of the pool and stay dry? Let's find out. In the pool, out of the pool, and I'm still mostly dry. Now here's what really happened. I got into the pool and I realized I should have duct taped the pocket because all the water went in there, down into the rubber boots, started filling up the rubber boots, and now my entire leg is full of water because the hydrophobic coating isn't letting it come out. So the hydrophobic coating isn't keeping the water out. Now it's keeping the water in. Let's take a closer look at Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. OK. All right, let's watch it back. When the sign hits me, I exert a force on the sign in the opposite direction. That makes the sign stop moving. It also exerts an equal force on me, causing me to fly off in this direction. Now, if I was to push this sign, I'm not only pushing the sign this way, but my feet are pushing against the ground in the opposite direction. It's, um, well, it's really easier to see if I'm not standing on the ground. Um, oh, hold on. Okay, so, huh? Oh, okay. So now that I'm hanging, watch. I push on the sign, but when I exert force on the sign to make it go this way, I go that way. Well, actually, it's, it doesn't work as well because the sign isn't as heavy as I am. So wait, I have this over here. This is a, a barrel, and it has stuff in it, and it weighs as much as I do. OK, so watch. If I push on the barrel like that, I go away from it as much as it goes away from me. So. There you have it. Newton's. Newton's third. No, hold on. Newton's. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. OK, go. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So using a giant balloon to push me on a cart uh, didn't work. And I, ah! What happened? The plan now is to use the compressed gas cylinder. Just like a balloon, these cylinders contain a lot of air. If we get a cart and put a gas cylinder in a cage, for safety, on the back and open the valve, the escaping air might have enough force to push me. This is two cubic meters of air. If we were to put it in a balloon, the balloon would be this big. But if we compress the air, we can fit it all into one of these, a steel tank. This is what we're going to be using next for our air-powered car. Got it? Yep. All right. Good. So Sarah and I have been hard at work, and we've built the air-powered cart. We can't call it a balloon-powered cart anymore, because now we've got a compressed air tank, so it's not a balloon that powers it. Exactly. OK, so I'm going to sit on here. Sarah's going to turn on the tank, and I'm going to go. And before we do this, we should say, do not, under any circumstances, Try this at home. We are trained professionals. You ready? I'm ready. OK, high five first. OK, now we do it. OK, so before I turn the tank on, make sure your feet are down and the brakes are on. Gotcha. Uh, Don't take them off till I say go. You have got it. All right. Ready? OK.
<laughs> yeah! It worked! Uh, yeah, it did work, but I feel, I feel like it could work better. You want to go faster. I do want to go faster. This reminds me of the rock car. Yeah. Well, we didn't have a big enough balloon. We need more force. We need more force. So should we get a bigger tank? Let's get more tanks. More, more tanks, more force. You're going to go faster forward. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. High five. All right, let's do it. All right. This is Newton's Cradle, and it's a really cool toy that demonstrates all kinds of laws of motion, including Newton's third law. Newton's what you do ball. is you pull this one ball out, and when it hits these balls, they exert force on that ball to make it stop. It exerts force on the ball, makes one in the end fly out, like that. Now, there's a lot going on here, but you can really see how the force is equal that you put in and you get out if you use two balls. I swing two balls up, and two balls go out that side. Isn't that cool? Now, it wouldn't be science max unless we maxed it out, so come on. Whoa, okay. This is one we built out of bowling balls. Bowling balls. Bowling balls. <laughs> Instead of smaller balls, and I think it's gonna work the same way. Let's find out. You throw one out, and, and <laughs> yeah, it works the same. Okay, now let's try it with two balls. Okay, ready? Wait, 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 wait. And two balls, throw them out. And two balls on that side. All right, so there you have it. Whoa. Newton's third law. Oh. Ah. Newton's ah. third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So our single pressurized tank created enough force to move me, but not very fast. The plan now is to do two things. First, we're going to triple the amount of thrust by using three tanks. We're also going to use some pipes that lock into each other to give me an initial push. These pipes slide together, and when the air is turned on, the pressure in the pipes will cause them to slide apart, which will push me forward. After that, I use what's left in the tanks to keep going. All right, now it's time to max it out. I've enlisted the help of a few more Science Max people. Thank you very much, Corey. You'll see now we have three tanks of compressed gas, and we've also got this nifty little contraption. How does this work, Sarah? All right, so each tank is attached to a tube, yeah. and you can see that each tube goes into this one main tube, so when we turn them on, pressure's gonna build up, and we're gonna go forward with more force. Well, that's great, and Reed is stacking cinder blocks. Thanks, Reed, uh, up so that will push uh, the pipe will push against the cinder blocks, and then I'll go that forward. way. All right, well, are you guys ready? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Now, again, I have to say, thank you, Corey, I've got it. This is something you definitely don't want to try at home. We are all trained professionals. We have a physics degree here. We've got TV people that make sure that this is safe. So uh, watch it and enjoy, but please don't try any of this at home. Okay, I'm ready. Sarah, count me down. Three, two, one. Yeah! Woo! Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> 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 that was awesome! That was really awesome! All right, high fives! High fives! Yeah, 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 yeah! <laughs> and it's raining now, so it looks like we're gonna have to stop. So thank you very much for joining us on Science Max Experiments at Large in our episode on Newton's Third Law. Science Max is a show where we take small experiments and do them big. If you want to try these experiments yourself, go to our website for instructions. But not all the experiments on Science Max are the kind you should try at home. This one, yes. This, no. Try this, don't try this. A big yes, a big no. I, I don't know how you could possibly do this one at home. And remember, if you're ever not sure, ask an adult. Thanks for watching Science Math Experiments at Large. Wait, I can play Mary Had a Little Lamb. It's working! It's working! <laughs> Newton's cradle at a bowling ball. Come on! You know this one, sing along. Whee! Come on! I mean, come on! Science! Yay!
Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max Experiments at Large. Science Max! <laughs> science! Today, Science Max is all about balance. Okay. If it's a potato or if it's me, figuring out how things balance is what we're all about. It works really well! Swinging, spinning, and staying put. Today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. Today, we're gonna be talking about whoa, balance, or what you call balance in science, which is center of gravity. Now, the center of gravity is a place you can find in any object where it's equally balanced on all sides. I balance this spoon on the eraser of this pencil, and where the spoon is balancing is its center of gravity. But if I take this little tiny dime and put it in the spoon, it doesn't balance anymore. But if I put the dime in the spoon and balance it in a different spot, I can find the new center of gravity, and the spoon balances again. Here's another experiment you can do. Take a potato and a ruler or a stick. Try to balance the potato on the ruler. I'm gonna save us both a lot of time. It's really hard to do. The potato does have a center of gravity, but because of its shape, it's going to be really hard to find and really hard to balance. But if you take some forks and you stick them into the potato, you're no longer just trying to balance the potato, you have to balance the forks and the potato and it gives it a very different center of gravity, which makes it a little bit easier to find and a little bit easier to balance. Ha <laughs> ha! Whoa! Let's take a closer look at how the center of gravity works using our potato. No, that's too close. Back off a little bit. Okay, good. If you want to find where the center of gravity is, you can hang an object and draw a line straight down. Then hang it from a different spot and draw another line. Do this one or two more times, and you can see where the lines meet is the center of gravity. If our potato was balanced on a stick, the center of gravity is a long way from the stick, so it's going to be pretty hard to balance. Now, let's stick some forks in the potato and try again. One line there, a line there, and a line there, and you can see that the lines all come together down here. That's right, the center of gravity doesn't have to be on the object. With the center of gravity way down there, when we try to balance the potato and the forks on the stick, you can see the center of gravity is much closer to the stick. That makes it way easier to balance. Now, because you're science maximites, I'm sure you know that a potato and forks is just the beginning. Everything you have in your house has a center of gravity, which means Theoretically, you can balance anything. Try it yourself. Find things around the house and see if you can get them to balance. And if you can't, try adding things to increase the center of gravity and make it a little bit easier. Now we're gonna max it out. That's why I'm gonna go to the center for skills development and training, and we're gonna explore center of gravity even more. See if we can get something to balance. And what better thing to balance than me? Oh, table, right. Hey, this is Sandia and Swapna. No, Sandia and Swapna. Right. And they are going for their PhDs in science. And you guys, thank you for coming. You. work with Let's Talk Science, right? That's right. All about science education, just like us. And I'm glad you guys are here because I need to max out this. Oh, look at it balance. Whoa. Hey, whoa. Okay, I got it, I got it, it's fine. Good. So we're gonna get a gigantic potato? Uh, no, I thought we would use me instead. So you're the potato. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm the potato. No, all right. And I need something to balance on. Well, how about a tightrope? Oh yeah, a tightrope. Have either of you done a tightrope before? Nope. nope. Me neither. All right, let's set one up. All awesome. right. Okay, good. 
We are going to take our balancing potato experiment and max it out. To get a potato to balance is pretty hard, but if you stick forks in the potato, it works a lot better. In our maxed out version, we're going to balance on a slack line, which is sort of like a tightrope. It's a flat strap tightened between two points. And in this version, I'm the potato. And instead of sticking giant forks in me, which is not something I want to try, Sandia, Swapna, and I are going to experiment to see what I can do to improve my balance. There. We're using this ratchet strap above a crash mat because we only have it about three feet off the ground, but it's still going to be really hard to balance on, right? Right. right. OK, so who gets to go first? Uh... OK, here we go. Um, ready? Uh, uh, hey. Got it? No. <laughs> mm. No. 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 <laughs> okay. I think what you need to do is spread your mass out more to be able to find that center of gravity easier. So I should balance on one leg? Start by trying to put your arms out. Let's Good try call. this again. Trying it again. All right. All right, arms out. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay, so I know what I say. You're going to let go. Ready? All right. One, two, three, go. Uh, no! It's a little bit better. It was a little bit better. A little longer. That way I went from one second to three seconds. <laughs> yeah! Yes! I would like to actually take one step. Okay. That would be nice. Well. What else can we do? Maybe we can try weights. Try and hold them out. If I have weights in my hands, that would increase the center of gravity in terms of putting, putting it, it the weight on the outside. You guys have something we can use? Yeah, sure, yeah. Actually. OK, good. Wow, these are heavy. Okay. These are weights. Yes, they are. <laughs> well, that's what they're for. They're supposed to be heavy. Good call. Why don't I hold this one, mm -hmm. and I'll borrow your shoulder, so I'm And then when I say, Sandy, pass me the other uh, weight. Here we go. Ready? And pass me the weight. Whoa, whoa, no, no, no. Okay, that didn't work. Okay, good. Whoa. Whoa. Okay, let go. Okay, let go. Whoa. Oh, oh no. Oh, it's really hard. I feel I would work better if I could lift yeah. the weights up, but they're too heavy for that. All right. So what else can we do? Well, tightrope walkers use a long pole so that they can balance on a tightrope. That's yeah. right. I've seen that. Uh, do we have a pole? We I can think go we find can. one. OK, great. I'll put the weights away. Have you ever heard someone say, I will be back in a jiffy. Well, now you can tell them that's almost impossible. You see, a jiffy is an actual measure of time. It's one one hundredth of a second. You see this timer? The first number is seconds. The second number is tenths of a second. And that third number that you can't even read it's going so fast, that's hundredths of a second. Each one of those is a jiffy. Here are some things that happen in a jiffy. A cheetah moving top speed travels 20 centimeters. A hummingbird flaps its wings almost once. Can you blink in a jiffy? Nope, takes 10 jiffies for that. How about snapping your fingers? Eight jiffies. So the next time someone tells you, I'll be back in a jiffy, you can tell them it took 170 jiffies just to say that. So I tried walking the slack line, and I wasn't very good at it. Holding my arms out at my side seemed to help a little. Then I tried holding some weights to see if that would make any difference, and the weights were so heavy, I couldn't really hold them out very far. Now the plan is to try a long pole. Tightrope walkers use long poles to help them balance. The longer the pole is, the more it affects your center of gravity, especially because you can move it up and down to help you stay balanced. Ta-da! Nice! So the important thing on this is, what, the, the balance, right? Yeah, That's you want right. to find the center of gravity of that as well. So, so try can... and find the center of the balance. Cool. The center is right there. That's where it balances. There, you got it. OK. How do okay. I hold this and get up on the on the strap? I'll help You're you. You're gonna help me? Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh-huh. Oh. Oh. You okay. Good? I think. Yeah, I think I got it. Okay. Yeah. Oh. You're balancing. Check it out. Hey, this isn't so bad. Hey, look at that. You can really use it to uh, cor help correct when you start to fall. You just move the pole, and that's whoa. Totally helping my center of gravity stay right in the center above the strap. Whoa. 
Whoa. <laughs> he can do it. A long pole can help tightrope walkers and me balance in two ways. First, it lowers my center of gravity. Normally, a person's center of gravity is about here. But with a pole, it changes to way down here, much lower to the thing I'm walking on. But a long pole also helps in another way, because in order to fall off the rope, I have to rotate. It's easier to rotate something that has mass in the middle than it is when the mass is spread out. That's why you put your arms out when you want to balance. A pole works just like your arms. The mass gets spread out way more and it makes it much harder to rotate around the rope and fall off. There you go, center of gravity. We're done. Usually we don't have it figured out this quickly. Usually we struggle a little bit more. All right, high fives. Way we did it. Go. Way awesome. to go. Um, so we did it. Yeah. We achieved what we set out to do, balanced with a pole. So how else can we use science to make my balance better? Well, tops are great because they, when they're spinning, they balance. That's right. So the forces uh, used when something spins is something I can use. Yeah. All right, this calls for another small experiment. Are you guys good here? Yeah, yeah. sure. We'll keep practicing. Awesome. All right, back to the lab. Bye, Phil. <laughs> Here's another experiment that's all about balance. Take a pencil and try to balance it on its tip. Doesn't work that well, does it? But if you take a pencil and stick it through a circle of cardboard and try it again, it works. The reason it's because this circle is spinning, it creates a force that keeps the pencil standing up. As long as the circle is spinning fast enough, it counteracts the force of gravity. Because of the conservation of angular momentum. The conservation of angular momentum. The conservation of angular momentum. Science Max presents ways to sound super smart. A top will balance when it's spinning. It works because it spins. But why say it that way when you can impress your friends and all the adults you know by saying conservation of angular momentum? Why does a top spin? Because of the conservation of angular momentum. Between you and me, we know that it boils down to the fact that it's spinning. But conservation of angular momentum is how you say it if you're studying physics in university. Just remember to thank Science Max when you impress everyone by telling them a top balances because of, say it with me, the conservation of angular momentum. Now, let's max this out. Gyroscopic force is pretty amazing. Because this bike tire is spinning, it's hard for me to move it. But it's really hard to see how much it resists a change in orientation unless I do this. <laughs> it looks like it's defying gravity, but really it's because the amount of force needed to change its orientation is more than the force of gravity pulling down on it. It won't last forever, only as long as the bike tire keeps spinning. But you gotta admit, it's pretty cool science. Look at that, it totally balances. Yeah. Oh. So this is this is a great way to balance. Uh -huh. Do you think it'll work if I hold it? Well, let's see you try. All right. Um, All right. So I'm, I'm gonna use you to get up on the thing, and then you go, give her. Yeah, that's good. And spinning it up. Here we go. Ready? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I, you can feel it, I can really feel it resisting and yeah. it, it I think it would work. I think and it just needs to be spinning a lot faster. That would make it even stronger, yeah. yeah. Uh, it kind of hit my chest, so. You know what, maybe you should keep it out to one side while it's still spinning, yeah. yeah. Well, that'll, won't that? I think you need two. Oh yeah, you're right, one on either side. It'd be great if we could actually have some way to, I can keep my arms free though. Yeah. Oh, I know, cool. get two wheels 
and we rope them into some sort of backpack situation. What? And we have a way for you guys to get the wheels spinning really fast. I don't know. No, no, I have it all in my head. Trust me, come on, I'll show you, I'll show you. Wait, you guys go around. Come, don't go on that side of the, of the. Time for a Minimax. Here's how you can use the forces of things spinning around to defy gravity. Well, sorta. Of. Take a ping pong ball and put it in a plastic container like a cup or this is the top of a CD spindle. Put it in and start spinning it around. If you do it right, you can get the ball spinning only on the sides of your container and not touching the bottom. That's the centripetal force at work. Oh. It works a lot better and it's much more impressive if you have something that doesn't have a bottom. Fortunately, I do. This bucket doesn't have a bottom. Put the ping pong ball in the bucket and spin it around. And if I'm very careful, I can lift the bucket into the air and ta-da, I'm defying the force of gravity. Science! Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, is that it? Is that all you're gonna do? No, of course not. This is Science Max Experiments at Large. This is a garbage can with no bottom in it. And this is a bag of golf balls. Let's see what happens when we put them together. Well, I managed to keep one golf ball in my garbage can. But as you can see, it works really well. And there you go, sort of maxed out. This is a garbage can with the bottom cut out, and this is a soccer ball. I'm gonna see if I can keep the soccer ball inside the garbage can using centripetal force. Okay. It's working! It's very tiring, though. How do you throw out a garbage can that's been used? Science! Here's a fun experiment you can do that plays with the forces created when you spin something. Get a flat platform or a tray and tie rope to every corner. Get an adult to help you with this. Then you get a cup of water. Use a plastic cup, definitely, just in case. You put it on the tray and you start spinning. Now the force is created when you spin something, centripetal force pulls the water to the outside of the circle. And because the centripetal force is stronger than the force of gravity, no water spills out of the cup, even when it's upside down. If you slow it down very carefully, you'll see that all the water is still in your cup. Now, I definitely suggest you do this experiment outside, and I definitely, definitely suggest you do it with an adult. Because when you get tired, which you will, if you don't stop it carefully, you'll have to explain what you've been doing. Science! Using science to improve my balance has totally worked so far. So now, Sandia, Swapna, and I are trying to figure out how to use the forces created when a wheel spins to help me balance. We need a spinning wheel on one side and one on the other. I've decided to take two bikes and remove the handlebars, seats, and front wheels, then cross them over each other and attach them to a backpack. Sandy and Swapna can use the pedals to spin the tires fast, and I will use the gyroscopic force to balance. Or at least, that's the plan. Behold, the gyroscopic stabilization backpack. Stabilization away! <laughs> I'm excited. Okay, you think it's gonna work? I think so. I'm kind of skeptical. Oh, really? You're skeptical? Why? I don't know. I don't know if you can do it. I don't know if I can do it either, but that's why we do science. Let's see it. Okay, spin me up. Okay. Whoa. Ready? Yeah. All right. And, oh, 
Ready? Go. Yep. Oh, yeah. It's working. Cool. It's working. It's actually working. That's good. <laughs> oh, it's getting harder. It's getting harder. Uh oh. Whoa. <laughs> that worked really well until the wheels stopped spinning. Yeah. And then what happened? Well, when the wheel was spinning, it was resisting motion in all directions so that you wouldn't fall. Yeah, but when they stopped spinning... You didn't have that anymore. That doesn't do anything. It's just a 50-pound weight on my back. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So I guess that's why tightrope walkers don't use spinning wheels. They use a pole instead. Right. But we've proven that they can. Exactly. Yeah. Max out, high five. Yeah. Woohoo! Yeah! I now have the balance of a ninja circus performer, thanks to... Science! Thanks for watching Science Max Experiments at Large. OK, spin me up. Spin me up. And we'll do some more science. Gyroscopic backpack to the rescue. All right, let's go. Science Max is a show where we take small experiments and do them big. If you want to try these experiments yourself, go to our website for instructions. But not all the experiments on Science Max are the kind you should try at home. This one, yes. This, no. Try this, don't try this. A big yes, a big no. I, I don't know how you could possibly do this one at home. And remember, if you're ever not sure, ask an adult. Thanks for watching Science Max Experiments at Large. We should put fans on them and I can fly! Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why didn't that work? And the reason is because I didn't do it right. I got two turntables and no microphone. I am defying. Come back here, spin it around, and, and spin it around, spin it around, and spin it. <laughs>
Who knows? Write down the amounts each time you use it and find out what amounts work best. That's called science. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. Chemistry in all its forms. And of course, because it is Science Max, experiments at large, we're going to max out the vinegar and baking soda volcano. So I'm off to the Center for Skills Development and Training. Come on. Hey, Talina. Hi, Phil. How you doing? Good, how are you? Good. This is Talina. She's going for her PhD in chemistry from McMaster, right? Yep. Awesome, which means you can help me max out the baking soda and vinegar. We need vinegar. You grab that vinegar and vinegar volcano. So what happens when we mix these two chemicals? Well, vinegar is an acid and baking soda is a base. And when you mix them, they neutralize each other to produce carbon dioxide and water as a byproduct. Hmm. So acids and bases are kind of like opposites. Yep. So I guess that makes sense. When you put them together, crazy stuff happens. Yeah. Awesome. Chemistry. OK, so I want to use this much vinegar and this much baking soda. What's with the fish tank? The fish tank is where I want to mix it all together. What do you think? Awesome. Maxed out. OK, uh, let's move the fish tank somewhere where we won't make a huge mess. It's a little heavy with all that. We get it. Uh, no, we're going to have to. We're going to have to take a couple trips. That's kind of heavy. OK, so we'll take this and that. And then this, and then that. No, hold on. I can do it. One more. OK, good. OK, good. Yeah. Uh, I took too much. I took too much. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That's good, Ramona. Put it in the, put it in the background. Put the sign in the background. Yeah, in the BG. I love the BG. Chemicals, 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 chemicals. What are chemicals? Are they things you have in a lab in a jar that say chemical on them? Well, yes. But if that's all you think chemicals are, then you need to know your chemicals. Turns out the stuff in the jar is a chemical, but the jar itself also made of chemicals. The table I'm putting it on. Made of chemicals. My lunch? Chemicals. Roller skate? Chemicals. My jacket? Chemicals. This guitar? Chemicals. My shoe? Chemicals. This watch? Chemicals. This fish? Chemicals. 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 Me? Chemicals. You? Chemicals. Ramona? Chemicals. No, I said you're chemicals. Chem- never mind. This is it. The periodic table of the elements. All matter in the universe is made up of these pure elements. They go together in different ways to make up everything. All matter. Think of it like building blocks. These little atoms are some of the elements on this periodic table. You got one oxygen, two hydrogen, bam, you got a water molecule. One carbon, two oxygen, hey, it's carbon dioxide. Two carbon, two oxygen, four hydrogen, skadoosh, vinegar. One sodium, one chlorine, hey, that's salt. All matter in the universe is just the stuff on here combining into these. And now, you know your chemicals. Mmm, sugar. Let's take a closer look at what's going on when we mix vinegar and baking soda. All chemicals are made of atoms. There's only four types in our reaction. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and sodium. When they go together like this, this is a molecule of vinegar, or acetic acid. And this is a molecule of baking soda, or sodium bicarbonate. When chemicals react, they switch atoms. That one goes there, this one goes over here, and then this one turns into this, and then what you end up with are new molecules. This one is called sodium acetate, and this one is carbon dioxide gas, the gas you breathe out. And do you recognize this one? Right, water, H2O. Why all this happens gets complicated, but the study of chemistry is all about how molecules are built and react with other molecules. All right, Talina, you ready? Yep. You're going to pour all your baking soda in the fish tank, and I'm going to pour the vinegar into this bucket, because you don't want to don't pour them together right away. OK, you ready? Yep. OK, go for it. 
When you're doing your PhD in chemistry, do you get to do stuff like this? Yeah. Really? I get to do a lot of fun reactions in the lab. Oh, that's, I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> Have you ever done this much vinegar and baking soda in one time? I can't say I ever have. There you go, that's what I like to hear. I already put the soap in the bucket so it would mix with the vinegar when I poured it in. Are you done your baking soda already? I am. I'll pour faster. <laughs> oh, faster. It smells vinegary. It smells vinegar, it makes me want french fries. <laughs> okay, Talini, you take this very full bucket of vinegar and dish soap. Thank you. I will take this one. Uh oh, we still have our third bucket. Okay, I'm gonna. I'll do these both at the same time. Okay, ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Whoa! 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 Wow! Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. So the one thing it didn't do, it didn't shoot up in the air though. Yeah, it's because the top is quite open. So you would need to constrict it to get it to shoot up. Oh, yeah, because we're using just sort of a square, mm -hmm. a rectangular prism container. We should get something that's maybe something more like our vinegar bottle, right? Because yeah. there's lots of space down here, but then it forces it into a tighter opening at the top there, um, like a volcano. Yeah. And what else can we do uh, to make it even more powerful, max it out? Vinegar is only 5% acid. The rest is water, so you could try using 100%. So what kind of acid is vinegar? It's acetic acid. So vinegar is actually only 5% acetic acid yep. and 95% water. So you can get 100% acetic acid? Yeah. Can you get 100% acetic acid? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Why don't we get a container that's sort of shaped like a funnel, like mm -hmm. a volcano, yeah. and 100% acetic acid, and we'll do it again. Sounds good. All right, let's do it. Our vinegar and baking soda reaction went pretty well. But now we're gonna try it with a much stronger type of the same kind of acid you find in vinegar. Carefully putting this down. And watch out for the baking soda. You never know when it'll get out. And well, I guess that's just baking soda, huh? Yeah, that's pretty safe. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so this is baking soda vinegar volcano version two. We have this differently shaped glass. What do you call this again? That's an Erlenmeyer flask. Why is it called that? It's actually named after a scientist. Did he look like that? Was he sort of shaped like this? No. No? Was he just a good chemist? Good scientist, and I think he designed the glass. Oh, see, there you go. So if you want to have a glass named after you, be a good chemist and design a <laughs> glass. I want to make a fill beaker. So this is 100% acetic acid. Yep. And what's the difference between this and vinegar? Vinegar has 5% of this and 95% water. But this is 100%, so it's much stronger. Much stronger. Can you put this on your french fries? No, I wouldn't be putting it on your french fries. No? As chemicals go, how dangerous is this? It's not too dangerous, but you definitely don't want to be breathing it in, and you don't want to be eating it. Or getting it on your skin. That's why I'm wearing these fancy pants of gloves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour the acetic acid in this. What's this called? That is a graduated cylinder. Because it finished school. <laughs> so it graduated. Now you're going to mix water and food coloring and soap all together yep. and pour it into there? It'll help dissolve some of the baking soda, so hopefully it'll react better with the acid. Sounds good. Face protection. Oh. All right, that's good. And now, when we do it, I want to add the funnel at the end to, like, accentuate the concentration of but I don't know if it's gonna go so fast that I won't be able to get it in there, but we'll try it. Try it. Vinegar baking soda volcano version two. <laughs> Good thing you got the mask. It smells a lot like vinegar. It's really strong. Oh. <laughs> That was pretty good, but what, what can we do to make it even bigger? Well, you could try using a different chemical reaction. Ooh, okay, like what? The decomposition of hydrogen peroxide produces oxygen gas, and so that one's pretty vigorous if you use a catalyst. So we want something that makes a lot of gas so that it makes a lot of bubbles when you put the soap in it. Yep. Great, let's do it. And the sooner you leave that smell, the better, I think, for my, for my taste. Today, we're combining two different chemicals to create a reaction. Sometimes chemicals can combine in a way that makes them very different from how they started out. For example, this is sodium, or Na, on the periodic table. Now, the sodium tablets are in mineral oil because sodium reacts very strongly with water, even the water in the air, or especially the water in my skin. Watch what happens when I drop a sodium tablet into this beaker of water.
very cool and very dangerous. And this is chlorine, or CL, on the periodic table. Chlorine gas is very poisonous. So, <clears throat> so what happens if we combine these two deadly substances? Do we create some sort of super poison? Something more deadly than anything else known to science that causes fear and chaos in chemistry labs all over the land? No, we create salt. Good old normal table salt. These two substances combine to make NaCl, salt. Something completely and totally safe. Chemistry. Oh, oh, oh. We've gone from vinegar and baking soda to 100% acetic acid in baking soda, and now we're doing the vinegar and baking soda volcano version three. No longer vinegar and baking soda. No. Nope. What are we using this time? So here we have some hydrogen peroxide. Oh, that's the stuff you use at home to put on a cut, right? Yeah, but the stuff at home is only 3%. This one's 30. So much, much stronger. Much 10 times stronger. Yes. And w is this more dangerous? It's definitely corrosive, so wear your gloves. Corrosive means it could eat your skin. It can burn your skin a little Which bit. is why we are wearing gloves and blast shield. What's gonna mix with this? So here we have some potassium iodide, which is a salt, mm -hmm. and it's mixed in with some water. The most important part of this reaction is the fact that it creates gas. Oxygen Which gas. makes bubbles when you put in dish soap, right? Yep. So one big squirt of dish soap like that. Mix it up. Now we go over to the blast zone. That's plenty. All right. <laughs> now that's a reaction. It looks like there's steam coming off here. Why is that happening? Well, it is an exothermic reaction, so heat is being generated as the reaction proceeds. Oh, cool. Can we lift our visors now? Yep. Awesome. And what's being released? What's the gas that's coming off here? So it's oxygen gas that's being produced. Oxygen. Ah. <sighs> what we want to do is make this even bigger, but first, can we do it again? Sure. Because I have an idea. Hold on. <laughs> I think we should repurpose our old volcano. What do you think? Sounds like a good idea. OK, so if we put it over here. All right, volcano version 3.5. <laughs> Hydrogen peroxide, potassium iodide. Right, here we go. Whoa! Looks like lava. Whoa! <laughs> Look at that. That, now that is a big volcano eruption. Just covered the town. That is completely, the, yes. Uh, that town is going to be very clean because it's all soap bubbles. It's the cleanest volcano this side of Science Maxville. So I still think we can do this bigger, though, right? I agree. Um, oh, I know. What if we use some sort of uh, a tube, like, like, like maybe one of these, right? And then we attach it to um, like an air compressor. I think you'd get some height. Yeah, and we go outside. The atom in 60 seconds. The atom is the smallest unit in a chemical element. Atoms are made of three parts. Part number one are these guys, protons. They have a positive charge. The number of protons determines the element. One is hydrogen, two is helium, three is lithium, and so on. The protons sit in the middle here, which is called the nucleus. They sit in here with part number two, these guys. They're neutrons and they have a neutral charge. Now I've got eight protons and eight neutrons in this nucleus, making this an atom of oxygen. Orbiting around the nucleus are these tiny guys. They're electrons and they have a negative charge. I will demonstrate using kittens. Kittens are perfect because just like electrons, kittens are really small. And just like electrons, kittens move around randomly. You never know where they're going to be, but an oxygen atom should have eight kittens, or uh, electrons, somewhere inside. These kittens are constantly escaping, but guess what? That happens with electrons too. There you go, the atom, a nucleus of protons and neutrons surrounded by randomly moving electrons. Cutest science ever.
How do you guys feel? Did you learn something? Huh? Pause up, who learned something? Hmm? Talina and I have made a bunch of chemical reactions, but in our quest to max things out, we've got a new plan. Whoa. Hydrogen peroxide and potassium iodide create gas. One way to max out the reaction is to contain the gas in something like a tube. We're gonna put the hydrogen peroxide in the tube first. Then we're gonna put in the potassium iodide in the top through a one-way valve. Then we're gonna pressurize the container. When it finally reacts, it will shoot up through the valve and we'll see how high we can get our stream of bubbles to go. But be warned, capping anything is not a good idea. So we've got a release valve to make sure things work out. This is one of those experiments that's definitely on the list of don't try this. Vinegar and soda volcano version four. Hydrogen peroxide, potassium iodide. And what we're gonna do this time is we're gonna hydrogen peroxide goes here. And we've got, Talina, do you have the potassium iodide and syringes? Yeah, two syringes full. Two syringes full. About there is good. And then soap. Good amount of soap in there. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna close this off and tighten it up. And then we're gonna pressurize the whole system. And then we're gonna add the potassium iodide and it's going to be spectacular, we hope. Okay, that's on tight. This is all good, putting this down here. And potassium iodide goes in here. Ready? Puts down, ready? One, two, three, go. And we back away slowly. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, let's check it out. Woo! All right, there you go. Vinegar and baking soda volcano max out. Thank that's you, Talita. Awesome. That was great. If you guys want any instructions for the stuff that we've done today, they're all on the website. And thank you very much for watching Science Max Experiments at Large. We kind of need to clean up a lot, don't we? Yeah. We have out here, we have the other room. So tell you what, uh, you get a mop, I will get the hose and a wheelbarrow for the sun. Science Max is a show where we take small experiments and do them big. If you want to try these experiments yourself, go to our website for instructions. But not all the experiments on Science Max are the kind you should try at home. This one, yes. This, no. Try this, don't try this. A big yes, a big no. I, I don't know how you could possibly do this one at home. And remember, if you're ever not sure, ask an adult. Thanks for watching Science Max Experiments at Large. Chemicals! Chemicals. The chemistry of hydrophobic coating literally repels water molecules and doesn't let her chemicals. Chemicals. Yeah. Two carbon, two oxygen, four hydrogen. Have you guys wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> My name is Phil, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Science Max! This episode is all about chemical reactions. Om nom nom nom, om nom nom, om nom nom nom, om nom nom delicious. Reactions to make things fly, to make things glow, to make things pop, and to make things fly. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Wait, did I mention the flying? I'm, I'm sure I did, but I'm mentioning it again because it's awesome. 
all on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. Okay, Science Maximites, prepare to heart go through the cosmos. I am Captain Phil, and today we're going to be building rockets on Science Max. Now, we've, we've built rockets before, like this one, powered by air pressure. And this one, stomp rockets, which were also technically powered by air pressure. Air pressure rocket! But today, Science Maximites, we are going to be building rockets powered by chemistry! Chemical powered rockets! Away! Mm. Okay, I promise it'll be more exciting than that. Because today, Science Maximites, we are going to be looking at chemistry. Chemistry is when two molecules combine to make another molecule. Like magic, ooh. So let's take a look at what will be powering our chemical rocket. This, it's an antacid tablet. When you put an antacid tablet in water, it makes little bubbles of carbon dioxide gas. This happens because of a reaction between two kinds of molecules called acids and bases. Like vinegar and baking soda, but all contained in a small package that won't start working until you put it in water. If we contain the reaction, the carbon dioxide gas builds up and creates pressure. High five for science. All right, so let's look at our chemical powered rocket. What you need is one of these. This is a, this is a film canister. And ask your parents what that actually means because they're not used for holding film anymore. You can get these at craft stores though to hold paint or little things. But really all you need is a plastic container with a good lid that snaps on nice and tight and keeps the air in. And then of course what you need are your antacid tablets and a little bit of water. So pour in some water and then put in your antacid tablet and snap the lid on. Flip it over and wait for the carbon dioxide gas to build up, which will build up pressure, which will... Launch your rocket. Ha ha, so there you go, a chemical powered rocket. Come on, let's max it out. So first, I need an expert to help me. Um, let's, oh, Lisa from Logics Academy, of course. Logics Academy people have helped me launch all the rockets on Science Max. This is gonna be great. Uh, oh, I'm gonna get my helmet first. Okay, let's put, let's launch some rockets! Let's go! Whoa, wow, it's really dark in this room. I can't see anything. Bill? Lisa? Bill? Lisa? Put, Bill? Oh. 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 Where did this come from? Uh, I guess the portal's malfunctioning. Hey, Lisa! Hi! From Logics Academy, great to have you here. Great to be here. Let's put this over there. We are here to max out the chemistry rocket! Ooh, what is that? It's just a small plastic container. But when we put an antacid tablet in there and some water... Ah, we get a chemical reaction. We get a chemical reaction, and so that's what creates the pressure, and then that pops the lid off, and we get a little rocket. Kaboom! But now we're going to max it out. Get a bigger container Ooh, and more. Wait. What? How about if we launch a whole bunch of them? Ooh, so we just get a lot of the small one mm -hmm. and we launch them all at the same time. Exactly. Okay, great. So we just need a whole bunch of these and yeah. a whole bunch of. And a whole bunch of science antacid. Yeah, well, that's okay. I get them both in bulk. Come on, <laughs> let's go, go put it together. And I'm a base, and we are enemies. <gasps> oh, well, we're not really enemies. Yeah, that's true. It's all about how we react chemically. You see, as an acid, I really want to give protons away. Protons, who needs your protons? Get your protons here. Protons, I got more than I want. I don't need them anymore. And bases, we need protons. We'll do anything to get them. Uh, protons, you can protons away. I'll take some, I'll take some protons. You think that when you get these two together, you'd have some pretty great chemistry. But the truth is, when they're together, they often don't react. Whoa. That is, until water gets involved. Once you have water, acids and bases react. Whoa. 
Here, take some protons. All your base are belong to us. Here you go. Take some protons. I don't need more. I want more. I want more protons. Here. Water is a solvent, allowing the chemical reactions to take place. Depending on the strength of the acids and bases, that reaction can be mild. Would you like? Proton. Oh, no, really, I could. Please, please take it. Oh, well, thank you, that's very generous. Have another. No, perhaps, maybe I will. Here's yes. one. Okay, um, maybe just one. But if the acids and bases are strong, the chemical reaction can be really extreme. <laughs> this is what's going on in the antacid tablet. And why, without water, nothing happens. Oh, water! Water! Come on! What'd you do? Oh. <laughs> One. Lisa and I are maxing out our chemical-powered rocket not by making it bigger, but by making more of them. How many more? 400 caps all glued down, 400 antacid tablets, or part of, yep. all glued down, and they're glued on this fancy-pantsy spinning surface. Hmm. So we rotate this part upside down. We fill each container with a little water and snap it on underneath. This way, the antacid tablet and the water don't mix until we flip it back over. It also allows us time to snap them all on. Okay, ready? Ready. All right, 400 containers. Here we go. Let's do it. Once we flip the board back over, the reaction started taking place, building up carbon dioxide gas and increasing the pressure until... Oh. Oh. So high fives on that. Yep. That worked spectacularly. That was awesome. So we've done this. Let's go bigger. Let's go bigger. bigger. Oh, okay. Definitely. So let's go and we'll clean right. this up afterwards. Yep, okay. Let's do it. Okay, let it go. Whoa. 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 This is a balloon, and this is an orange. When you put them together, a chemical reaction happens. Ah, uh, how'd you go in there for a minute, didn't I? Hit? No? No? All right. Well, you can actually do a chemical reaction between a balloon and an orange. You see, balloons are made of latex, which is a kind of polymer that's very, very stretchy. And orange peels contain a chemical called limonene. Limonene breaks down latex. <laughs> so, we have three questions. The first is, why does this happen? Well, like I said, it's all chemistry. You see, balloons are made of polymers, chains of molecules held together by chemical bonds. A limonene molecule attacks those bonds. Om nom nom nom, om nom nom, om nom nom nom, om nom nom, delicious. And breaks it, that separates the polymers, and that pops the balloon. But remember, it only works with natural latex. So make sure you're using natural latex balloons. Second question, why do they call it limonene when it's in orange peels? I mean, yes, it's in lime peels and lemon peels, but the chemical itself smells like oranges. They should call it orangenine or, or citrus fruitinide or... Anyway, third question, should we max it out? Of course we should, come on. 200 balloons versus two bottles of limonene. Ready, go.
Our first attempt to max out our chemical rocket was 400 plastic containers. Oh, yeah. That worked well, but now it's time to make the container larger. Whoa! Giant maxed out chemistry rocket canister. I have a big plastic container with a groovy lid that sits there on airtight, which is great. And I have a giant jar of antacid. How many? It was like 60 antacid tablets or something? At least. This works exactly the same as our smaller containers. We dump the antacid in, seal the lid airtight, then flip it over. And now would be a good time to mention not to try this at home. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's not gonna oh, take long. So that was the canister version. Now we need the pop bottle version, the yes. rocket version. Yes. OK, let's go make that. Let's do it. OK. <laughs> this is a light stick. It creates light using a chemical reaction. There's a liquid chemical inside and also a glass container that holds another chemical. When you bend the light stick, you break open the container and the two chemicals mix, creating light. There you go, light sticks, chemical reaction. And yes, of course, we're gonna max it out. This is a whole bunch of the two chemicals in a light stick. Let's max it out. So how does a chemical reaction produce light? Well, a lot of chemical reactions produce energy. You might think of a chemical reaction producing heat. Well, heat is a kind of energy. This chemical reaction also produces energy, just energy in the form of light. It's just a different kind of energy. Whoa, max out light stick! <laughs> and now for a Science Max quiz. Chemical change or not? What's a chemical change? Well, let's demonstrate. Look at this. It's a happy little molecule of iron. And here's another molecule of oxygen. If they were to have a chemical change, they would react and form different molecules. Look, it's a molecule of rust. Rust is a different chemical than either iron or oxygen. It's a chemical change. Now, if these molecules mixed and did not change, then it's not a chemical change, it's a physical change. Sometimes it's hard to tell if it's a chemical change just by looking, but asking what kind of change it is leads to good science. So let's look at some examples. Vinegar and baking soda. Is it a chemical change? Yes. Vinegar and baking soda react to form different chemicals. Sodium acetate, that's the white stuff that's left over, and carbon dioxide, which makes the bubbles. How about a nucleation fountain with diet cola and mints? Haha! -ha. A lot of people think that's a chemical change, but it's not. The mints cause carbonation, the bubbles, to escape faster. But in the end, you still have cola and mints, no new chemicals. And without the carbonation, nothing happens. So it's a physical change. Take a guess at this one, glow stick chemicals. Well, producing light or heat is usually a sign of a chemical change. How about mixing sugar and water to make a sugar pop? That's a physical change. You start with sugar and water, you mix them, and when you have a sugar pop, what chemicals are you left with? Well, sugar and water. So, no chemical change. It can be hard to tell sometimes, but whenever two things mix, think to yourself if it's a chemical change or a physical change. And now you know it's either one or the other. And that's the first step to good science. Thanks for playing our Science Max quiz. Our maxed out rocket worked great. <laughs> <laughs> now to make it look more like a rocket. So we have a mesh bag here to put the antacid in. Right. And we have um, some paper clips attached to it. And what are the paper clips for? Well, Phil, we have a magnet. Ah. And so the magnet sticks to the paper clip. And so that's what we have here. You see the bag is full of the antacid tablets, which we put through the mouth of the bottle and the magnet is holding the paper clips on the other side of the plastic. So we can sort of move it along. So we can start with the bag over here where the water's down there, but now we attach the launcher like so. All this effort is to keep the reaction from happening until the bottle's on the launcher and we're ready to go. And then as we pull the bottle over, we bring the bag up this side 
And there, the water and the antacid have never touched. No reaction. All you need to do now is just, we pull this magnet away and the bag will fall into the water. And then we will have the launcher down here. And we pull the release and the rocket will go. We add some weight to the launcher to help keep it in place. Okay, right, wait, glass in. Safety first. Okay, ready? And then we pull the string with the magnet that drops the man acid tablets in the water and starts the chemical reaction. Because we have a latch holding the bottle down, we can wait until the chemical reaction happens fully. And there's a lot of gas pressure in the rocket before... Three, three two, two, one... one. Woo! <laughs> that worked. Yeah, I hit the ceiling. Uh, I think we need to do this outside. Yeah, I think we definitely have to do it outside. All right, totally great. Weird. Anyway, I was saying we should put three or four of them. Three, two, one, go! <laughs> outside and it worked great. The only thing left was to max it out even more. So, larger chamber? Yep, more antacid. More antacid, more air, more water. Absolutely. Bigger rocket. Okay, so you know what? I know how to splice two bottles together and we can increase the size right. of the chamber. This is sodium acetate. How do you get sodium acetate? Well, when you do a vinegar and baking soda reaction, what you have left, once the reaction is finished, is sodium acetate. It's a crystal, and you can do something fun with it that may seem familiar. You make a super saturated solution of sodium acetate by heating water and dissolving as much as you can, and then when it cools, you can get the crystals to reform. Now, if you did this with sugar, you could make a sugar pop, which we've done before. If you do it with salt, you could make a salt pop, which is less appealing, and you do it with sodium acetate, you can do this. Just like with the sugar pop, all it needs is a seed crystal to get the crystals to reform. But unlike sugar, which takes a few days, sodium acetate recrystallizes right before your eyes. Because we heated the water, it allowed more crystals to dissolve in it. Ooh. But then it cooled down afterward. There's more crystals sitting around in this water than there should be at this temperature. They want to turn back into crystals, and all they need is something to start them going. I've colored this one green because, I don't know, science. Maybe it'll look cool. A tiny crystal on the end of the stick is all we need to start the reaction happening. Whoa! Wow! And there you go! Sodium acetate! Hmm. That one wasn't done yet. We've gone from small containers, oh yeah, to a large container, <laughs> to a rocket. <laughs> yeah! So what's next? Super maxed out rocket! <laughs> 12 two liter bottles all spliced together to give us a very large chamber to build up pressure with. So the chamber is all the same. So it's all one big hollow tube. And now we're gonna fire it off. Let's go! Let's do it. <laughs> awesome rocket! Yeah! Lisa and I follow the same procedure as before. We use a bag of antacid tablets held up inside the rocket with a magnet. And once it's sealed on the launcher, we pull it off, let the antacid mix with the water. Let the chemical reaction happen for a while to produce enough gas pressure, and then we fire it. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one, go. Oh, oh my God. shot a rocket on Science Max. That's amazing. Well done. Chemical Reaction Rocket. Thank you very much for joining us on Science Max Experiments at Large. We should build another rocket because that one so. is probably broken. That's done. Okay, let's go. Let's do it. All right, so this time I think what we should need to do is... Ah! Oh no, it's nothing but garbage cans in there. We gotta turn the portal off. Come on, we gotta get...
Science Antacid, the perfect antacid for all of your science needs. So let's launch some chem... Let's launch... See, vinegar is a base, and baking soda is an acid. That's not right. <laughs> vinegar is an acid, and baking soda is a base. Science guy. Have you ever done a science experiment and wondered what it'd be like if you did it big? I have. <laughs> Bill, and I take your everyday science experiments and do them big. This is Science Max, experiments at large. Science Max! This episode of Science Max is all about earthquakes. Exciting. How do we build something that won't fall apart when shaken? Plus a lot of other ways to shake things or build things. Science! All on this episode of Science Max, Experiments at large. <laughs> Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be looking at earthquakes. Earthquakes. Huh. Today, we're going to be looking at how to build something. <laughs> that was supposed to happen earlier. Today, we're going to be looking at how to build something that stands up to the shaking of an earthquake. Mm. Earthquakes happen when two plates on the Earth's surface rub together, and it causes the ground to shake. It causes the ground to shake. Sometimes it shakes a little, sometimes it shakes a lot. Chances are you do not live in a place that has earthquakes. But if you do, ask an adult what to do during an earthquake so you can be safe. Modern buildings that are built in earthquake zones are designed to withstand the shaking. But how do scientists and engineers build a building that stands up to the shaking of an earthquake? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at today. First thing we have to do is simulate an earthquake. We're going to build a shaker table. And here's what you need. Two books that... Oh. 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 Two books, four elastic bands, and four, four rubber balls. Oh, wait. Uh, okay. <laughs> four, four rubber balls. All right. So the first thing you do is actually take your four elastic bands and wrap them around your books. Put one set on one side, one set on the other side, until you have that. Then you take your four balls and you stick them in between the books in the middle-ish area, but you don't want to have them too close to the edges. And now two at the back, and ta-da! You've made your own shaker table. What are you shaking, you ask? I will show you. You build a tower, well, like this one here that I built out of building blocks. So here's what you do. You'll need your base to be securely attached to the shaker table. I use painter's tape because it'll come off again without harming the books. And what I want to find out is just how much shaking this tower can take before it falls apart. Ready? Oh. And there it goes! And when you've done that, what you do is you be a science maximite and you design another tower and you tape it down to your shaker table and see if you can make this tower fall down in an earthquake. And if you built it really well, it probably won't. Aha. But you don't have to just use building blocks. There's all kinds of other materials you can use. Check out this building, which is really tall, and you'll see there's a cup at the top, and that's for a baseball. Put it up at the top, and that means there's a weight up there. And then we shake it, and we see what happens. Oh, oh no! Oh, there it goes. So that is what we're going to be doing today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We're going to be making a giant shaker table and putting a giant structure on top and seeing how we design it to make sure it stands up to the shaking of an earthquake. I'm going to need an expert to help me, though. Um, oh, I know. Anne would be really good at this. Okay, all I need to do 
is get Anne, and we can start. Oh, come on. There it is. All right. Hey, Anne, I... Huh. I feel weird. Why do I feel weird? I think you're a chair. Well, that's not good. Oh, hold on a second. Am I... Am I good? Okay. Hi, Anne. Good to see you. Here's your lab coat. Thank you. So you're from Let's Talk Science, right? I am. All about science education, just like us. Today, I need your help to max out our earthquake table. This is the table this looks part, great. obviously, but this is a tower I've made out of popsicle sticks. So yeah. in order to max it out, I've already built a large shaker table. Come on. This is my large shaker table. So it's got basketballs underneath as the four balls, but it works exactly the same. Whoa. 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 <laughs> okay, so what kind of tower should we make for the shaker table? If we want something tall, then we'll reinforce it a couple spots. But the true test, it's got to have some sort of weight on top so that it will mimic the weight that would be on a real tower. Right, so maybe I could get a plastic bin and I'll just put some sandbags for weight inside. That would be perfect. And then balls so that when it falls over, the balls will go everywhere. That would be perfect. Okay, great. We shake off. Whoa. Uh, I don't know. Okay. I think we should just get off. Another thing that happens during an earthquake is soil liquefaction. Liquefaction means something turns to liquid. In this case, the very ground you might be standing on. Here's how you can experiment with soil liquefaction. All you need is a plastic container and some water, not very much, barely enough to cover the bottom of the container because what you're gonna put in next is sand. And you want to put it in there and spread it around. Just add enough sand so it just starts to turn dry on the very last layer. So here is a house that I'm going to put on top. And now I will simulate an earthquake. The water rises up and it sort of turns to liquid. Soil liquefaction. And heavy things like houses and cars, they tend to sink like that. And then the soil rehardens, and everybody's houses are stuck in the mud. Now, let's max it out. This is a giant tub of sand and water, and this is a vibrating platform that will simulate an earthquake. Now, as you can see, this sand is totally solid. I can jump all around on this sand, no problem. But when I turn on the vibrating table and simulate an earthquake, Things will change. Whoa! The vibrations bring the water below the sand to the surface and cause the sand particles to separate. What was solid now turns to liquid in my simulated earthquake, and I start to sink. I'm up to my shins! And there you go! Soil liquefaction! Hey, look at that. It's totally solid. <laughs> Woo so I gotta look my back in. I'm totally... Uh-oh. You know what I realized? When it stops vibrating, it really becomes solid again. And it's very tough to... <sighs> well, there, there you go. Soil liquefaction. I'm, uh... I'm really kind of stuck in here, I... So Anne and I have made a large shaker table. Now it's just a matter of designing a building. We use lumber and cut it up, use screws to attach it all together, put a platform on top for a weight, and attach it securely to our shaker table. The building is super simple. Just four corners and a few planks around the outside. No structure in the middle. And finally, the big heavy weight on the top. There. We attach a pole to the shaker table so we can shake from a safe distance and try it out. Okay, very slow. Forward. Let's see how much shaking it can stand with our shakeometer. Okay. Uh, that seems to be okay. Kidding. Oh, oh no. Oh no! We barely start to shake our tower before it collapses. Oh, that didn't really last very long, did it? It completely folded up on itself. Uh, what do we do to fix this, make it better? I think the easiest thing we can do is to use thicker wood. It'll make it less 
wobbly. Okay, sure, let's make another one. Bye, Fuzz. We do have lots of wood, that's a good thing. Ann and I are trying small improvements every time. There. Our last building used thinner pieces of wood. Now we're using thicker wood, which we think will help keep the weight at the top from collapsing the building. Everything else about the design of our building is the same. We put the weight on top and fix our pole, and we're good to go. All right, you ready? Problem. But it recovers. You can yeah. see it lean, and then it comes back, and it re and it resets. Definitely doing better than the last one. Oh no! I'm impressed. Oh, uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. here uh -oh. we go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely did better than the first one. It did better than the first one. And the thicker wood definitely helped. But it was really starting to turn. I think on the next one, we need some platforms in the center to help strengthen it even more. Earthquake building 3.0. Thicker wood this time, but with platforms in the middle. So we're going to see how well this version works with these middle parts that will hopefully reinforce. And they're just like the floors of a building. OK, well, let's find out if it's going to make any difference. It's gonna wobble a little, but it looks pretty good. As soon as we start shaking, it's really obvious this building is more solid. Uh-oh, it's starting to creak. Oh, it's really starting to creak. The platforms in the middle really seem to improve the structure. You can see it bend all the way over and still recover. But still, it wasn't long before... It's really starting to lean. <laughs> Extra pieces really kind of made it more impressive. It definitely lasted a lot longer than the other two. It did, but here's what I'm wondering. Are we going in the wrong direction? What do you mean? Well, because if it's really solid, it resists the change. OK, I see where you're going with this. So if we make it flexible, it can resist the shaking of an earthquake. I think it's worth a shot. Yeah, OK, let's do it. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. My tuna fish and meatball sub soup is coming along quite nicely. But what will we have for dessert? I know. How about earthquake buildings? Ha <laughs> ha! It's a building made out of wafer cookies. But the people on Vanilla Street built in the gelatin neighborhood. And the people on Chocolate Street built in the crispy rice part of town. Exciting. Now, here comes the earthquake. Oh, no! Oh, it's shaking! Oh, the shaking has come and gone for the people on Chocolate Avenue, and their building is still standing. Now, let's take a look over here on Vanilla Street, and here comes an earthquake. Oh, no! Oh dear! Looks like the people on Vanilla Street are going to have to rebuild their building because it's all fallen over and being eaten. Mmm, <laughs> delicious. Buildings can be built the same way, but the kind of soil they sit on make a large difference if there's an earthquake. Shaky, wiggly soil or solid, non-moving soil. So there you go. An experiment you can try at home. Delicious. Well, I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on this episode of Cooking with Science. Mm, now to try my soup. Seismometer in 60 seconds. Learning how to predict and measure earthquakes is an important branch of science. The Earth is shaking, but which way did the earthquake come from? It's all about measuring the vibrations, and to do that, you need a seismometer. All you need is a ball, some paper cups, some modeling clay, a pencil, and science tape, which is the same thing as invisible tape, except I use this tape for science. First, take your pencil and stick it straight down into the modeling clay. Then, you take your cups and you arrange them in a circle and tape the cups down. And that goes right in the middle, just like that. Now, what you do is you take the ball and you carefully balance it on the pencil. Now you have created a seismometer. It will tell you what direction an earthquake came from. Watch, I will be the earthquake. Ready? Did you see that? The ball fell into the cup facing the direction that I hit the table. And now I'm gonna hit the table from over here. Yep, it fell in the direction that I hit the table. Okay, let's try from over here. There you go, your very own seismometer that you can use to measure earthquakes that you create on the table. 
back to our earthquake building. Anne and I tried a few different designs and they each got a little better. But now we're wondering what would happen if we built the tower out of very flexible material. We used some plastic tubing and attached the wood with bungee cords, which are like big elastics. Wow, okay, so looks good. So let's test it. Okay. And sure enough, when we start shaking it, the tower holds up to as much shaking as we can give it. Wait. What? Aren't we missing something? Oh. Yeah, we're missing the weight at the top. Of course. So I think we need to try it again. So we add the weight to the top, and then everything changes. Oh, oh no. Look at it twist. Oh, dear. It's twisted. A flexible go. tower is great until you try to put a weight at the top. And then it just seems <laughs> really unstable. Oh, there it goes. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. It's totally bent. It didn't break at all. It just fell over. Yeah, it couldn't even support the weight. So it was almost too flexible. So I guess we should go back to a more rigid design. Mm -hmm. But what if we change the shape a little bit? Because mm -hmm. you know what I was thinking. This is a very stable shape. Mm -hmm. Triangle, because triangles are really strong. What about um, we, we make an X? Like a triangle within a triangle. Triangle, and then triangle. So that really reinforces all of the shaking, like all of the motion. We'll never know until we try. All right. Uh-oh. I have all my friends coming over, and I don't have a table. But that's OK. I will make a table using my friends. This is an awesome experiment you can do with four friends. Come on in, science friends. I've got Sam and Dylan and Polly here to help me. So everybody turn to your left and sit sideways on the chair and then scooch the chairs into the middle. And then everybody leans back onto the knees of the other person. And then, this is why I said you need four friends, because you need the fifth person to remove the chairs! Oh. The reason why this works is because everybody's weight is being supported on the legs of the person next to them. Okay, we're gonna rotate in a circle, everybody. Okay, ready? Here we go, rotating, R rotating. Oh, oh, science table. Ooh. Hey, we're pretty good at this. Okay, uh-oh. Oh. Oh no, oh no! <laughs> so there you go. Awesome way to make a table using your friends. Well done, well done. Science. Here's an experiment you can do to impress the adults in your house. You need three glasses, all of equal height, and three knives, not sharp knives, the dull knives you use, maybe the ones you use at dinner time. Take your three knives, and put them in a triangle, all equally spaced out. Then move the knives together to make a little triangle, all right, like that. Then what you want to do is you want to carefully arrange the knives so each knife is going above one knife and below another knife. So there we go. Then you want to take this careful pattern that you created, and you want to put it on top of your three glasses. One where each handle of the knives are gonna be. And if you place it carefully, and you've done the over-unders correctly, it will stay up. Pretty amazing, the knives support their own weight, but they don't just support their own weight, they can support a lot more weight too. Pretty amazing, right?